Well, welcome back to another episode of Parker's Pensies. This is a podcast where we explore thoughts in philosophy, theology, nature, and life. I love thinking about cool stuff, so come think with me. Today, I have another special guest with me, Dr. Michael Ray. Uh, for many of you, he needs no introduction, but I'm going to give one anyways. Uh, this dude is a legend in philosophy and theology, analytic theology, uh, everything we love talking about the show. This guy is uh, is a huge name in that in those areas. So. Uh, just really briefly, he is uh, the Reverend John A. O'Brien, Professor of Philosophy and Director of the Center of Philosophy of Religion at uh, Notre Dame. He's taught at the University of Notre Dame since 2001. Uh, his research focuses uh, on pretty much everything that we talk about in the show, which is fantastic. And um, he's also uh, at the University of St. Andrews. Is, is that right, Dr. Ray? Are you, are you at, at St. Andrews still? Yeah. Um, yeah. So Notre Dame is my primary appointment. St. Andrews, I have what's called a fractional position. That's right. Okay. Yeah. I was, I was trying to look for that part there. Um, thanks so much. There, we could spend the rest of the podcast just talking about your accolades here, but, uh, but we don't have time for it. Thanks so much for coming on the podcast. This is really huge for me. Yeah. Thanks for having me. I'm a, I'm a little bit nervous because we're going to be talking about the hiddenness of God. And, uh, this is a fantastic book. We're going through this in, uh, in a class here at TED's, God Revealed and, and God Hidden. And uh, it's it's hard because I want to cover everything in your book, but there's just no chance of doing that. So uh, for all the listeners out there, go buy the book. There's a ton in there uh, about analogy to about God's uh, revealedness and hiddenness, about um, uh, experience, mystical experience, uh, experiencing God, uh, chapter seven. So there's a lot more in there than just this problem of of hiddenness, though, if it were just the problem of hiddenness, that'd be sufficient. Um, Dr. Race, uh, this book is is awesome. But before we, we dive in, I want to just get uh, your story of philosophy. How did you get into philosophy at all? <laughs> um, not not by a kind of usual route. Um, I took a so I took a philosophy class my freshman year at UCLA, mm -hmm. and I hated it. Um, I literally, at the end of the quarter, I went back to my dorm room, opened up the college catalog, crossed out that course, and then I crossed out the word philosophy and thought wow. to myself, never again will <laughs> I take this stuff. Um, but then uh, about two years later, uh, so I guess end of my sophomore year, beginning of my junior year, I needed to fulfill some requirement. I took a class uh, called Skepticism and Rationality, and it was hmm. focusing mainly on arguments for and against the existence of God in early modern philosophy. And that one, I just, I loved it. I thought it was a lot of fun. Um, I, at the time, I was just picking it up as a second major. Um, but then uh, people started telling me that, you know, maybe I should think about going to graduate school. and. Um, at the same time, I was realizing I had initially planned to become a pastor, uh, but I was realizing I really like the teaching aspect of things more than some of the other aspects of pastoral ministry. And so I thought, yeah, doing uh, doing philosophy that that might be fun. Um, and uh, so then I ended up going to Notre Dame for graduate school. And then the rest is, you know, history, as they say. Yeah, yeah. Well, so uh, you are kind of at this nexus of philosophy, philosophy of religion, analytic theology, uh, and obviously you've, your, your work puts you in, in any of those categories, uh, but is there one that, that draws your, your attention more? Do you consider yourself more of a philosopher, more of an analytic theologian or theologian, uh, just implicator? Where, where are you at, or, or do you actually think you fit at the nexus of, of those and other disciplines? Uh, of those options, I would say at the nexus. Um, I, I mean, one of the things I've been really kind of interested in doing for the last decade or so is blurring the boundaries between the fields and not, you know, um, like treating analytic theology as something that's truly interdisciplinary, uh, mm -hmm. insisting that there's not a sharp division between philosophy and theology. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I think of myself as sort of working in uh, both equally. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. It's been it's been huge for a lot of us coming up who who look to you and, and uh, are excited that you're blurring those uh, boundaries or, or or more rightly rightfully saying these boundaries are artificial and and they shouldn't be there in the first place. Yeah, that might be a better way of putting it. 
Yeah, yeah, that's that's been really helpful for me. Um, so, so then moving on, so we, we got you into philosophy, and uh, if I'm not mistaken, you did your work there with Alvin Plantinga, is that right? Yeah, that's correct. Okay, and wh what was your dissertation on? Uh, the problem of material constitution. Um, right. So, you know, uh, you make a statue of, out of Play-Doh, uh, you know, called the statue Gumby, um, but look, uh, the statue cannot survive being squashed back down into the shape of a ball, but mm -hmm. the piece of Play-Doh can survive that. And so, uh-oh, looks like you've got two things in the same place at the same time, but we think you can't have two things in the same place at the same time, so what's going on, right? Yeah. And this is a puzzle that's received a ton of attention. It turned, at the time I was getting started in this, um, there were a bunch of other puzzles that were used to defend the same range of views as that one, and people hadn't really explored the relationships between them. Mm -hmm. and so that's kind of what my dissertation did, explored the relationships between these puzzles, identified a common problem, uh, and then uh, explored some solutions. Okay, did, did you, so uh, those familiar with your work will, will note that you, uh, you worked on the material or the constitutional view, what's come to be known as the constitutional, constitutional view of the Trinity. Did you bring that into your work at all or was that a later project? Uh, it's interesting. When, so when, it, when I was writing my dissertation, um, there was a view that I was inclined to defend um, that uh, as I was defending it, um, I, you know, I sent a paper off to a journal and I was also talking to people about it and um, the journal referees, the friends I talked to, they all said, that's just nuts. That, <laughs> that is just nuts. And, you know, I was a grad student needing a job and I thought, I kind of totally see why it's nuts, but, um, but, you know, maybe I should back off of this for a little bit. So I included it in my, I included the view in my dissertation as something worth considering. And then I defended another view. Um, and then later on, uh, my friend Jeff Brower uh, called me. Um, it was like seven or eight years later. He, you know, called me and said, hey, I, you know, I'm thinking this, uh, this view that you sort of explored, um, maybe it's got some application to the mm. Trinity and I kind of see it in some medieval figures. And I said, well, you know, that's like, that's kind of what I've thought too, that it could be applied to the Trinity. Let's work on this together. And, um, and that's how that uh, paper ended up getting written. Okay. Well, that's awesome. Yeah. The, I love that you kept it in there and it, and it uh, bred some new life afterwards. Did, did, uh, before we get into this, did, did this also uh, influence your, your book, a world without design did that set up the the uh impetus for for making that or was that just a wholly new project um yeah i'm not maybe more a new project okay. um you know when i was thinking about world without design in the early stages i was thinking um i want an argument against naturalism mm -hmm. um and of course, my, you know, my research had been on material objects. And so I was thinking, I was sort of thinking about naturalism and what it might imply in that domain. Yeah. Um, uh, and then that's how that book sort of came together. Okay. Okay. Well, so moving on to, uh, to divine hiddenness, um, when you first came across this hiddenness problem, did you see it as a, as a serious problem or did it later become more of a serious problem uh, with the work of like Schellenberg and, and other philosophers? I, I think I saw it right away as a, in some sense, a real problem. Um, okay. it not, you know, uh, it, people don't always read prefaces to books, but um, okay. if you did, I mentioned in the, you'll know that I mentioned in the preface to this book that um, my first encounter with it was in conversation with a friend of mine after church. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I forget how we got onto this topic, but, um, you know, we were talking about the sermon. We were talking about how God interacts with us or doesn't. And she just started crying and said, you know, look, I mean, I've served God my whole life. Why can't he just once whisper, I love you? Mm -hmm. um, and I had no answer for that. And, uh, and I, and that, like, obviously, you know, here we are 30 years later, that's totally stuck with me. Yeah. Um, 
And so I, I had this kind of, you know, visceral grasp of the problem at the time, but no real sort of philosophical grasp of it. Um, and then it was just a couple of years later in my first year of graduate school at Notre Dame that Tom Morris, hmm. um, you know, he was teaching a philosophy of religion class and he said, there's this new, you know, kind of interesting philosophical problem of divine hiddenness. And he kind of laid it out. This was, I think this was like shortly before Schellenberg's book was published. Okay. Um, and, uh, and that really gripped me. Uh, that's a really interesting problem. You know, one of these days I should work on that. Um, <laughs> but you know, the way a lot of people do things and the way I was doing it was, you know, publish a lot in, uh, something that's not philosophy of religion for a while, uh, get a job, get tenure, and then start publishing more of the philosophy of religion. Yeah. And so I just kind of had it on hold for some years. Um, uh, and then finally got a chance to sort of think about it more systematically around, you know, 2008, 2009, something like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's really helpful to know that, that, that it was something that you took seriously at first too. When, uh, when I first encountered the, the actual problem of hiddenness as, as formulated as a problem, I thought, you know, well, well that, that's not that big of a deal. And I kind of had the same reaction as, uh, as you lay out in the book to some, uh, some of the lay thinkers, lay people listening to your talks who yell out, well, God's speaking all the time. And I thought, you know, this is, this isn't a problem. We need to focus more on the problem of evil. Let's focus back on there. And then as I've as I've encountered it more, as I've thought through and had had to read various books for courses, uh, yeah, just realizing, oh, this is a, a serious problem. And so for me, it, it kind of took the other direction. And it's interesting, too, to, based on uh, different denominations, I think that it, it arises differently for people. And you you laid that out, I think, maybe in Chapter 6. Yeah. Uh, and, and that was really cool. I had this problem accidentally raised for me at an Athletes in Action summer camp. It's a, a crew ministry. I was a wrestler in college. And we, had, we just went through this huge experience and uh, of, of trying to trust the Lord through our sports and, and being, you know, uh, the, the refs messing with us and stuff like that. And this big, huge mountaintop experience, literally we're on a mountain and this guy goes, hey, just close your eyes and, and listen for God, listen for how he thinks of you. And I was like, hey, you know, I don't really hear anything. And it was like, you accidentally raised the problem of hiddenness for me, dude. You thought this was going to be, you ruined the experience. Uh, and, and the Lord worked it out later, which was great through. Yeah through some affirming words, but I think back and, and it depends on, on your uh, denomination. You might feel this differently. If you're expecting to auditorily, you know, hear from the Lord, this problem might be a really big deal for you early on. If you're actually not hearing from the Lord. Yeah. So I, I thought that was interesting. And you, you bring that up as well. You say, this is really a family of problems. And I, I've found that so helpful in even looking at the problem of evil or looking at different arguments for God's existence. Usually what we're talking about is a family of things going on and, there's kind of a person relativity to arguments for and, and against God. One of the, the funniest things about this book was uh, you, you write really well. You write um, really clearly. Thank you. And a lot of the analytic theologians in your wake, uh, I kind of consider myself a, a budding, you know, analytic theologian, but I'm tempted to put everything in propositional form to, to prove I have some philosophical chops. And I really appreciate that you don't, you don't do this. You write really clearly. Um, but one of the best parts of the whole book, you, you talk about divine uh, divine ghosting. Yeah, I, I just laughed out loud because I'm here. I am. I'm reading this philosophical theology and philosophy of religion, and you talk about you know God ghosting us. I thought that was just so awesome. That was fantastic. Uh -huh. Can you briefly lay out you know divine ghosting? Can you briefly lay out this problem of hiddenness for us? Um, yeah. So yeah, the ghosting bit was um, uh, a sort of reference to the idea that in some people's experience, it's as if we just never hear from God, mm -hmm. you know, God, uh, I mean, I guess if you want to stick with the metaphors, God sent us an extremely long text message, right? <laughs> which we have as scripture and then nothing, you know, after that. Um, but I, I mean, I guess that, so the hiddenness problem, um, in one sense is just totally easy to get a handle on. Um, I'd say, you know, most believers in God in any of a variety of religious traditions have uh, probably struggled with it at some point or other. Um, not everybody, but even the even the folks who haven't at a certain point, you know, and talking with people, they they get the problem. And it's something like this. Um, you know, God's supposed to 
God's supposed to love us tremendously. In the Christian tradition, God is supposed to love us like a perfect parent, right? But um, but parents, good parents give their kids um, things in the form of communication and comfort that it seems like God doesn't give us, right? Or at least not in the ways that we might want or expect, you know? Um, so if one of my, I got five kids, if one of my kids gets hurt, you know, I'm going to, like, of course, I'm going to go, you know, give them a hug, um, tell the kid I love them, uh, you know, things like that, and try to try to be of some comfort. Um, you know, I tell my kids I love them just about every day, mm -hmm. right? Um, verbally, I don't leave. I don't leave them to infer it from the right. fact that they have a roof over their heads or something like that. Mm -hmm. Right? Uh, and most of us think like that's just that's what decent parents do, right? Yeah. Um, it, it's not even like it's not like I'm such a wonderful parent because I do it. It's more like that's just basic standards. Yeah. Um, so why do we get that from God, right? Um, and of course, it's not that God hasn't, uh, it's not that we don't have reports of God doing things that show tremendous love, right? Again, in the Christian tradition, Jesus died for our sins, and we know that from scripture. Um, and so, of course, people will say, you know from that that God loves you, but it's just, it's not the same as the daily, Yeah, you know, it'd be like if your spouse was like, look, I said I do on the wedding day. You know from that that I love you. Why do I have to still be saying it to you 10 years later? And the answer is, well, like, <laughs> obviously, we're just, we're built to need that. Yeah. Right? So at, at a kind of um, common sense level, you might think of the problem as just, there's a lot of people who aren't getting what they feel like they need experientially yeah. from God. Um, and since it's part of the concept of God to be perfectly loving, um, and since you would expect a perfectly loving being just minimally to be giving those things, it looks like the fact that they're not getting it is evidence against the existence of God. Yeah. Now, Schellenberg, um, as you'll know, has focused more on the belief aspect of things. And this is like, this is another side to the problem of hiddenness. So Schellenberg's thought is um, roughly, you know, look, uh, if God's perfectly loving, God's at least going to be open to relationship with everybody. Mm -hmm. um, and a pretty minimal condition on openness is a disposition to remove whatever obstacles are on your side of the relationship to that relationship happening, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if, you know, like if I'm open to a relationship with my neighbors, and I've got like a 20 foot concrete wall around my house and, you know, an electrified gate and things like that. You might know, think, well, a minimal condition on being genuinely open to the relationship is either I go outside periodically and show myself or I take down the wall or at least, you know, like I remove some of these obstacles. Mm -hmm. And Schellenberg says like a pretty serious obstacle is not even having the concept of God or not having enough evidence to believe in God. And so what you would expect if there is a perfectly loving God, one who's open to relationship with everyone, is that there wouldn't be anyone who is not actively resisting God, but doesn't have what they need to form just basic justified belief in God's existence. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, but he says, we do find non-resistant non-believers in the world. Yeah. Uh, we find people who, who they can't really even be resisting relationship with God, he thinks, because they don't even have the concept of God, right? It's not even occurred to them that there might be such a being. Um, and he points to like prehistoric peoples as examples of that. Yeah. Um, and so he thinks here, too, you have an argument against the existence of God. Yeah. So sort of summing it up, there are people who have what they don't, what they feel like they don't need experientially from God. There are people who seem like they don't have what they need kind of cognitively to form belief in God. And if God's perfectly loving, you would have expected God to not allow those things to happen. Yeah.
Yeah, that's that's really helpful. And so um, the Schellenberg case is is like an argument against the existence of God. But then, uh, as as it takes various forms, there can be like a sometimes you people refer to the religious problem of evil. So it may not be an argument against God's existence, but it's like why am I existentially experiencing this? Now, um, there's an existential problem of would you you would parse those out between the the uh, argument that God doesn't exist from hiddenness versus like the religious, I still believe in God, but I have a problem of hiddenness. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And maybe, maybe the way to think about it um, is to stick with the problem of evil for a moment and just think about how um, people, I think, often react when really bad things happen, um, even if they retain their faith. Right. Yeah. So, so one thing that stands out in my mind, um, some years ago, I was set to teach on the problem of evil um, in one of my classes. And the day before the the day before the class, um, a Notre Dame student was killed. Um, he was up on a scaffolding filming football practice I remember and, that, yeah. and it blew over in high wind. And yeah. it just was a shock to campus. And um you know, like you think, why would God do that, mm -hmm. right? And and people, um, so I, I'm not even close to the person. It was deeply, I didn't even know the person, right? It's deeply right. moving. It's, you know, you find it inexplicable. Um, and one of the things that uh, I ended up saying to my class later is, um, you know, like when you think about the problem of evil, like if you have religious faith in a certain way, you like you already know that there's a reason why God permitted it, mm -hmm. right? Um, and it's not like that fact makes you think, oh, well, that's totally cool, right? Right? Yeah. And in thinking about that, I realized like even if God came down and told me, you know, like you know, pick one of the worst things that happened to you, right? So I think of something in my life that's horrible. And even if God came down and said, look, here's why I let that happen to you. It contributed in complex ways to this greater good. It's it's not like I'd necessarily say, oh, okay, great. Yeah. Right. I'd right. still I'd still think still why you're omnipotent. You know, I, I might still be angry about it. Right. Yeah. It might right. take a while. And so I think that's maybe a way of getting at the sort of existential uh grip of the problem, even if you think you have a philosophical yeah. answer to it. Yeah. I think that's such a great point too about emotions and, and time. And so even if you did have a satisfying answer, it might not feel satisfying right away. You might have to mull it over and chew on it and, and think through because the way God designed our emotions even. Right. Right. That's helpful. Um, sticking on, on the problem of evil, uh, I wonder... Um, you, you mentioned how, how people think of hiddenness in different ways, and some see it as maybe a subset of evil or a sister or a cousin. Uh, in, in my head, I'm thinking you could probably just use all the categories of the problem of evil and apply those to hiddenness. You know, why is there so much hiddenness or why is there you know, gratuitous hiddenness or whatever? Uh, in, in your mind, uh, as you're thinking through, how do you see the relationship between the problem of hiddenness and the problem of evil? Yeah, um, so I, I think they're both what you might call problems of violated expectations. Yeah. Right? We, you know, we have a concept of God <clears throat> and that generates certain expectations for divine behavior. Mm -hmm. Those expectations get violated and then, and then we have questions. Right. Um, and I guess, you know, whether some version of the hiddenness problem uh, turns out to be a kind of subspecies of the problem of evil or not. It just depends on whether the violated expectations are, um, I, I guess, whether the hiddenness that you're talking about um, counts as an instance of evil, mm. suffering, right? Yeah. Um, so, like, you might think... Um, uh, the mere phenomenon of non-resistant non-belief in God is neutral. It, like it's not like somebody being tortured, right? Yeah. Uh, which is just what, no matter what, wherever that occurs, that's bad, yeah. right? Um, 
someone non-resistantly not believing in God, maybe that's, um, you know, maybe that's in some cases bad, in other cases not bad. Yeah. Um, or someone not having loving experiences of God. Maybe in some cases that's bad and in some cases not bad. And if I give you a think of, well, how could these things not be bad? Um, you just cook up strange sorts of uh, examples, right? So, you know, somebody who has a significant kind of, um, they're significantly cognitively different from us so that they can experience love from a being um, but they never really form explicit beliefs in existence, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so they're constantly bathed in the love of God. They're in heaven. They enjoy the beatific vision of God. They're, for whatever reason, they're not forming explicitly a belief that this is God. Yeah. Right? yeah. Um, and, you know, maybe cats like get something like this. <laughs> in the I thought about that. Right? Like dogs, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and so you would like, you know, a cat in heaven enjoy, you know, enjoying life with God, you might think, is it a problem that the cat is non resistantly lacking belief that there is an omnipotent, omniscient, perfectly good being? Yeah. Nah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so, so all that to say, you can cook up examples where these things, yeah, maybe they're not intrinsically evil. If they're not, then, um, that version of the problem of hiddenness is not a subspecies of the problem of evil mm. um, because the existence of hiddenness doesn't imply the existence of evil yeah right? wow that's really that's that's so helpful that to to show that the, the two can come apart like that yeah that's that's great and use cats too which i mean some people will will uh jump in and say cats won't be in heaven so maybe this whole experience is out because maybe dogs will but cats you know um Real quick before jumping on, I, I love the violated exp expectations that you bring up because it, it really sets up your whole answer. But uh, just just getting your opinion here uh, randomly doesn't really have much to do with your your argument at all. But do you think that there are people who lack the the concept of God or have lacked? Um, I know it's not integral to your to your piece here at all. Just randomly wondering. Yeah, so I think it's virtually undeniable that there are people who um, lack the concept of an omnipotent, omniscient, perfectly good deity. Okay. Right? Yeah. Um, and, um, and that is a concept of God, mm -hmm. and that is what Schellenberg calls the concept of God. Yeah. Right? And not for bad reasons. Um, right. But one of the things I try to do in the book is say, um, you know, it's not the only concept of God. Right. right. I mean, something can count as a concept of God, basically, if God's the best candidate for satisfying it. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, an ancient person who's never encountered, you know, maybe, a, you know, some contemporary of Abraham. Right. Yeah. Um, in some other part of the world who's just never even encountered the idea of the um, the God who, you know, the Abrahamic faiths worship. Mm -hmm. um, they're not going to have the concept of an omnipotent, omniscient, perfectly good deity. Not clear that Abraham even had that concept. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, but can I say that they have no concept that's a concept of God? No concept, like, you know, the concept of whoever made all this. Right. right? Mm -hmm. You know, I bet is loads of primitive peoples had concepts like that. Right. right? At any rate, I don't think I have evidence that they didn't. Yeah. Um, and so on that, on that issue, I'm going to say, you know, I, um, I think Schellenberg's on solid ground when he's saying there have been people who don't have the classical concept of God, but um, but it seems just speculation whether uh, there have been people who've had no concept that in fact applies to God. Okay, yeah, that's that's really helpful, and yeah, and it like I said, it doesn't it doesn't matter a ton for your argument here. Just uh, randomly curious, but so setting up uh, your your answer to the problem. Um, 
I, I, I like this idea. We talked about this a little bit be, before we start recording, but like a hard line and a soft line response. And so maybe maybe looking at violated expectations, uh, a soft line response would just accept those and say, you know, the way that Schellenberg or someone else has, has uh, set up this problem of divine hiddenness. Yeah, that's fine. I, I accept the premises. I accept the way the, uh, the argument, but I'm going to add something in and say, here's a greater good or here's a subsequent good or and, you know, an antecedent good that that is necessary. And, and so hiddenness is necessary if we want these kind of goods. And I, I kind of think of that in a, in a soft line reply and then a hard line reply like yours would be to deny these these intuitions from philosophy. Um, can can you, one, do you, is that is that a fair characteristic uh, or characterization of your view? And then maybe just, can you can you lay out your view for us? Yeah, um, so I, I like the, the hard line, soft line distinction here. Um, I mean, maybe the way I'd parse those labels is like this. The um, uh, the hard line is um, uh, it's something like um, the the hiddenness problem isn't really even managing to target belief mm -hmm. in the God of the Christian scriptures mm -hmm. because that God uh, is transcendent um, in some importantly robust way that um, that has the result that um, divine love is not, uh, it's not enough like human love um, to entitle us to make inferences from violated expectations to the conclusion that, you know, either God doesn't love us or that there's no loving God or anything like that. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, and this, you know, divine transcendence has been a big part of the Christian tradition. Um, uh, it's, um, it's an attribute of God that has been taken deeply seriously by theologians, um, throughout the tradition, but like on up to, you know, even in contemporary theology, which I think is why the hiddenness problem um, hasn't really had much purchase in yeah. academic theology. Um, and that, you know, when I first started talking about it to some folks in the theology department here at Notre Dame, they were like, what on earth? <laughs> <laughs> what kind of problem is that? Yeah. You know, but it, it's because, um, the idea is that you know look of course god loves us and uh but divine love is just so different from human love that um you can't just uh consult your intuitions about love and then make inferences about how god's supposed to behave yeah um that said uh not everybody likes the doctrine of divine transcendence um and some folks i think understandably reasonably um say this is too hard of a line like if divine love is really that different from human love yeah. why do we call it love mm -hmm. um i mean uh you know if i tell you look i've got um uh i've got a kind of love for you that is consistent with my completely sabotaging all of your uh hopes and dreams you might think well <laughs> call it love if you want right but that's nothing that I consider. I, I mean, it's not intelligibly related to what I'm thinking of. Right. And, and that is, I mean, I have things to say about that in the book and, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. But for folks who, who think along those lines and say, now look, divine love has to be, like what it has to be is just a, a perfected version of this very same thing that we call love. Mm -hmm. um, to them, I offer what you might call the softer line, which is, okay, let's grant that. And um, uh, let's grant that we can form a lot of expectations by consulting our concept of love. Mm -hmm. Still, we can see that divine love is not going to be what it's often taken to be in the hiddenness literature, namely just a um, a maxed out version of yeah. human love um, and pretty severely condensing what I say about that, like sort of the upshot is um, maxed out human love is just total devotion. 
yeah um what we might call worship right mm -hmm. and like as soon as you bring in that term worship you can see what the problem is going to yeah. be god right god of course not god's not going to have total devotion yeah i.e worship for us right the christian tradition has never said that um uh the bible never says that uh the most fitting objects for god's total devotion are the persons of the trinity yeah right mm -hmm. of course god loves us and god loves us a lot but god does not have total devotion to us and god um and uh, you know as i say there it seems pretty clear what god's gonna do is balance our interests with other things that god's pursuing and some folks say, well, now, wait a minute. You think God's pursuing other things that might conflict with our interests, you know? Um, and to that, I just want to say, well, like, yeah, of course. It, I mean, yeah. <laughs> first of all, Scripture is pretty explicit on that. God does things, you know, for God's glory, mm -hmm. right? And that's a huge priority for God, often at the expense of the short-term interests of people. I, I think saying God does things for God's glory, it hits contemporary ears, at least mine, pretty badly. Like yeah. God's some kind of narcissist. Yeah. Um, but if you think of it as more like um, one of God's projects is living out the perfectly beautiful divine personality, mm -hmm. um, albeit with an absolute commitment to defeat in the context of our lives all of the evils that we suffer, right? Mm -hmm. That that feels better. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I think that that puts God's love for us in the right balance and mm -hmm. perspective with God's love for God's projects. Yeah. Right? God. Um, and I I mean I guess I think too like the you know the only alternative to saying that God sometimes sacrifices our interests for other projects is either to say that the bad things that happen to us are actually in our best interests, which yeah. is when you start considering horrendous evils, mm -hmm. right? that's just repugnant. Yeah. Um, it amounts to saying those things aren't really bad. Right. Um, you know, or, um, uh, well, God sacrifices our interests for no good reason at all. Right. And that's not. Yeah. <laughs> that's not any better. Mm -hmm. um, and it, I mean, it is. It it's clear. I think that our interests do sometimes like bad things happen to us. And I like a picture, a uh, theological picture, on which we can say, yeah, the you know the you know these things that. The things that you've suffered that you recognize as bad, they are bad. They're, I mean, they're just outright bad, period. But they're, you know, at the end of all days, you will see that their badness has been defeated. Mm -hmm. By which I mean, um, when you look at the the life as a whole, you can see that thing. You can recognize it as bad, and yet you can see that the life is beautiful. And that somehow that bad thing was integral yes. to the beauty of the life, yeah. even while still being bad. Um, and while still being against your in, your interests at that time. Yeah. So we don't have to lie about that. Or we don't have to, you know, trick ourselves into thinking this is great for me. But seeing right. it in context makes sense. Right. And I think the Christian story about the crucifixion of Jesus is a nice illustration of this, mm. right? Like Jesus's life was a good and beautiful life mm -hmm. the uh the passion and the crucifixion were horrible evils that christ suffered yeah um i think it's theologically repugnant to say you know actually the passion and the crucifixion were good things like right. it was good the the romans who were whipping jesus the people who drove the nails in they were doing good things hmm. that's theologically repugnant um it's also re i think theologically maybe not repugnant but it's not so good to say well you know it was a life that was on balance good like you've got the bad things weighing down one side of the scale but then the good things just tip it right it, not i mean it's like weirdly 
paradoxically in a way that only God could bring about. Like the the bad things are integral to what's good about the life right. while still being bad. Yeah. And that's like that's the concept of defeat. Um, yeah. That's not my concept. It's a concept that goes back at least to um, it's either Roderick Chisholm or Terence Pinellum, and then it gets developed in nice ways by Marilyn McCord Adams, who's a philosopher and theologian who's yeah. had a lot of influence on me. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, that's that's huge. I I don't. I'm hesitant to bring this up, but it, it actually sounds a little bit like your work on material constitution where you have two things here, but not really two things. And they're both together. It's, it's, yeah. And it's kind of paradoxical, but it, it still makes sense when you explain it. Um, that that's great. I really like that. I, I like, uh, I like you, you took up, um, uh, Jordan Westling, uh, his, his view on love and maximal loving. And he was, he was my neighbor here at Ted's for a little while. Oh, okay. and, and, uh, and, and you're, really generous and nice, but, but also just brutal with, uh, not, not towards him, right. But towards this view. And it, it gave me this picture of God. If we take our intuitions about love and, uh, you know, my father, our father, our, our, our um, experiences with love from these relationships and you balloon those up into God, like what you've said, you, you didn't say it outright, but it, it makes God in this helicopter parent who is worshiping us. And that's really inappropriate. And you say, you know, borderline. Uh, you know, it's 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 not great at, at best, but at worst, it's it's idolatry or it's it's worship. You know, he's he's he'd be worshiping us, and my inner Jonathan Edwards is like, absolutely not. No, you can't do that. So yeah. I thought that was that was really helpful, especially because you didn't just hang everything on transcendence, which I'm inclined to. I love any any. I love your conversation of transcendence. Oliver Crisp has been bringing that up. James Anderson. I love that. But just in case you don't, here's another reason why we should not balloon up our concepts of love. So I thought that was really helpful and really, really clear. Uh, yeah. I, wanted, I wanted to read your um, your definition of divine transcendence. I, I don't know how helpful, sometimes it's hard to talk about this stuff. Uh, like, again, guys, go read, go buy this book and read it. It's, it's a lot clearer when you can read it, but uh, divine transcendence is whatever intrinsic attribute of God explains the fact that intrinsic substantive predications of God or of the divine nature that express non-revealed concepts are at best analogical. And so if you don't have a revealed concept of, of God, that the God's told you about himself, then your intuitions are, uh, your intuitions about these sub intrinsic substantive predications of God, like his goodness or his love are at best analogical and analogies break down. So you may say, well, I have this intuition that a loving father would do this. And so therefore God as a loving father ought to do this. But in, in making that predication that God is a loving father, that's at best analogical. And so there's some room for him to do things that you wouldn't expect your own humanly father to do. Is that, does that sound right? Yeah. Yeah, that's good. And um, I guess I, maybe what I'd add is uh, I included the bit about um perfectly transparent revealed concepts because yes. i guess i do think um if a perfectly transparent concept is just it's one where your intuitions are about that concepts application are are totally reliable right okay. when you think yeah of course that concept applies to this sort of thing you you are on sure footing yes. right when I mean, you think of course it doesn't apply you're also on sure footing a revealed concept is one that you have derived somehow from divine revelation. So like basically if you if you found philosophical analyses of love or knowledge or whatever in scripture, um, then I think you could talk fully literally about as far as my characterization of transcendence goes, you could talk fully literally about divine love, um, divine knowledge and things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I, I want to leave open that yeah, maybe there are those those kinds of concepts in scripture, but I, I really think the concept of love that we work with and apply to God, um, it is not perfectly transparent yeah. and it's not, we don't quite have, I don't think I have a revealed concept of love. I mm -hmm. have. I have divine revelation that deals in human concepts of love by way of analogies like loving parent, loving, you know, good employer, um, 
things like that. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You, you also mentioned this in, in a footnote and I thought it was really helpful. You said, cause I immediately thought, well, you know, God's love for me. And you said, well, God's love for me is a, it's a state of affairs. But when we're thinking about God's general character of love, that's that's a different story, and and that is more analogy. And so, yeah, I can I can know the state of affairs that God loves me, but when I'm thinking more more maybe abstractly, or I'm thinking about the divine nature, you know, Himself itself, like, yeah, that we're we're getting back into analogical predication, and I love analogical predication. I think that's fine. Um, and it it kind of depends, I guess, maybe on your your view of analogy. I, I think that you can speak literally by way of analogy, though not univocally. But I think people, some people would say, well, if we're going to believe that scripture is perspicuous, then we need literal univocal truths. And you brought up this this problem of, of hermeneutics as well. And so uh, just bolstering your case that if you think you have this divine concept, like this concept that's been, I don't know, divinely illuminated, or you've perfectly abstracted it from scripture, okay, cool. But that's uh, that's different than us sitting in our armchairs reasoning about what God must be and and great making properties and then making problems for God's existence from those musings. Yeah, yeah, it's so helpful. I, I love that. Again, guys, read the book. It's 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 great. <laughs> um, not only like I said earlier about hiddenness, but divine love and God's love for us and state of affairs. I thought all of that was really helpful as well. Um, so sub substantive predications, uh, you say, are roughly those that neither apply to everything nor are trivial logical consequences of truths about God. So like God exists and God is self-identical. Those are non-substantive predications. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. And, uh, and I guess also things like God is such that two plus two is four, right. you know, right. and stuff right. like that. Yeah. Not substantive, but but substantive ones would be like God is good or God is love. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. That's that's really helpful. Um, and so then you move on from transcendence, and then your your view of love as well, um, or your your conversation about love to humility about expectations. Yeah. And uh, I wonder, would it be more helpful if I if I read a quote from you, or if you just uh, give that to us yourself? Uh, go for the quotation. Yeah, yeah. Let's do it. Okay. So, so suppose F is an alleged intrinsic attribute of God, and suppose we have formed expectations about the manifestation of F-ness on the basis of our grasp of a non-revealed concept of F-ness. In that case, the violation of those expectations does not by itself support, imply, render probable, or justify belief in the conclusion that sentences predicating F-ness of God are not true. And so that, that F-ness, we can fill in love or God or whatever. And it's really just fleshing out your transcendence idea a little bit more. Yeah, yeah. And again, it's in in simpler terms, it's, uh, you know, you for things like love, goodness, and so on, you can't infer from violated, violated expectations on God, uh, about, you know, pertaining to love or goodness that God's not loving or good. Right. Whatever. Yeah, and so it's it's I I really love this idea because it's saying God didn't fulfill my expectations, and you say, well, what expectations are those? Well, I have this idea of goodness, and I have this idea of love, and God, based on my intuitions, has to do this, this, and this. And you say, well, who told you that those are the right uh, inclinations? Who told you that those have to? For, did God reveal that to you? Well, if He didn't, then there's still some some room here. You you should be a little bit more humble about your pronouncements about the existence of God, if these are just from your intuitions and not from revelation. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Humility. It's great. It's a, it's a good thing. Humility, especially about expectations, because why think that you have infallible expectations as well? Why think that, that your ph philosophizing is, you know, uh, infallible or, or inerrant such that you can use yours to say whether God or, exists or not. Though, I, you know, I don't think you would say this either, but, or I think you would also say, I get it. Like, I get why you're doing this, but also if I can help you be a little bit more humble in your expectations, not, not yeah. condemning, how dare you, but. Yeah. And, you know, one, um, one thing I'd like to point out about that. Um, one of my, uh, one of my most valuable interlocutors while I was writing this book was, um, 
my friend Michelle Panchuk, who teaches at uh, Murray State University. And one of the things she's pointed out about um, this whole humility about expectations thing is it sounds um, disturbingly close to what abusers tell their victim. Hmm. You know, um, like basically, look, this this abuse is for your own good, yeah. uh, and you don't see it, but it is. Yeah. Um, and you just got to trust me, hmm. that sort of thing. And so it it is important to. I, I want to say that because, like, first of all, I don't want to give comfort to that line of reasoning right. in the human case. But of course. also, it just, you know, as we're talking about this, it occurs to me that people might be thinking along these lines. And so what yeah. I want to say is it's, it is, that is why I think it's crucial um, to add to the story that we have um, a lot of, information about what God, uh, information from scripture yeah. um, about what God has done for people that pushes us in the direction of telling, it pushes us in the direction of understanding God's behavior on the whole as loving behavior rather than just as weird, unusual behavior or, yeah. you know, or something else. Yeah. Right. And that was one of the kind of things I was trying to do at various points in the book, too, is um, just sort of highlight things that God does for people that um, that lend support to positive analogies about divine love instead of other, because that is one of the big questions that comes up here, right? If divine love is so different, why do we even call it love? Right. And the answer is um, uh, because on the whole, the stuff that we hear about what God's doing and stuff that, you know, the, the portrait of God in scripture on the whole is the portrait of someone who is much more in the direction of loving than in the right. direction of something else. Yeah. Well, and, and that's what I really appreciate about your work is because, uh, is that it makes me want to read the Bible more. It makes me want to, well, yeah, let me, let me correct my conceptions and my intuitions by reading this revelation more, it's put a, a deeper emphasis on having concepts that are formed by God's word, what, what he said about himself. And I, I really appreciated that because it's not just a negative um, defense, but it's also, it, it, it should lead to this positive, what is God like then? What does he say about himself? Let's see. Because, and, and even if you're doing it in a contentious way, well, what, what does God say? Yeah, well, go read the Bible. That's a great thing to do. Go do that. Yeah. Yeah, so I really appreciated that because uh, sometimes, sometimes you can just give like the the smoke screen. Well, why think that, right? Or why think this? Why think that? I'm I'm putting this up here, but actually giving some some positive uh, some positive ways for people to increase their their knowledge of God. I thought was great, and their conception of divine love from from God's own word Himself. Um, with, with that in mind, do you think that? Um, so we've characterized how the problem of hiddenness is is different. You can. It can pop up for different people based on different uh, backgrounds or different theological beliefs or, you know, it's an argument against God's existence or it's a religious problem. Do you think that, this might be hard to talk about yourself here, but do you think that your book or your work in this book has solved that uh, atheistic problem of hiddenness? Do you feel like it, it's successful? Um, yeah. Um, I mean, it's That's a hard question. Yeah. You know, ta so talking about philosophical success is tricky because there's right. always people who disagree with you. Right. And, um, and it's, I certainly don't think, well, anybody who disagrees with me is just, they're just not getting it, you know, right. or right. something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, but I guess maybe the way to put it is, um, I've developed a solution to the problem that, I'm happy with yeah. and that I feel like I can defend. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's a solution that makes, um, it has made a difference to me, yeah. uh, you know, spiritually and in you know, the various ways in which I've struggled with the hiddenness problem. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've, you know, like one of the, several things that pushed me to working on this, you know, one of them is just um, a kind of 
like why does why do so many other people seemingly uh have these vivid experiences of god and i don't you know um i mentioned my friend stephanie uh in the book who like um when i knew her i was serving as a youth leader she was like a junior senior in high school and she was um and i knew her beyond like she ended up going to the university where i taught at the time university of delaware and um she was always saying things like um well you know jesus just said this you know or yeah. whatever. and finally like I, like how does this work for you yeah. you know and i was thinking like why don't i get this um yeah. and uh is she the coffee shop she said you know where's yeah. my friend and she felt like god said to go to the coffee shop and there he was yeah yeah, yeah. and that you know the stuff that basically the views i've laid out in the book um have made me feel better about my own pattern of religious experiences or lack of them or whatever you know like it made me feel like it's not so it's not so important to have those kinds of experiences and there are other kinds of experiences that are um you know that i might actually be able to learn how to have you know and and those and those would be valuable and you know and and even if i can't learn how to have it it's maybe not a big deal because it's just a psychological profile issue and mm -hmm. you know god shows me love in other ways or so i don't know like all that to say um the the overall line there is a solution that I, I found satisfying and um, uh, maybe that's all one can hope for. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, that's, that's pretty big uh, that in itself. And I, I also, um, I also thought that was really interesting because I have, uh, I'm, I'm, I love considering myself an evangelical above everything else uh, in the proper sense, not in the, in the voting sense. Right. But uh, so I have friends all over the place and some people saying, you, you, you know, my, my dad is, uh, got saved in a charismatic movement and then, then went instantly uh, from there to a really staunch Baptist uh, community. So depending on the day, he's either saying the Lord speaks to you only in the, in the word or, hey, Jesus just told me this morning, right? And yeah. so, so I have that going on as well. And, and that was really helpful thinking through, yeah, this, this psychological profile or God made me this way. Right. And so maybe he speaks to me in different ways or maybe, you know, but but at the end of the day, I still have to have my concepts of him. If I want to think of him rightly formed, informed by scripture and all of us need to do that no matter what. And I, I, I thought that was really encouraging as well. And just seeing that that God might be interacting with people in different ways. That's OK. That's a, that's great. And God made us to, to be like that. Yeah. Sharpen each other. I thought that was really encouraging. Um, if if well. Let me just ask it. Is there more work to be done on hiddenness? And if so, do you have any any uh, suggestions for people following in your in your tracks here where they might go with this problem? Um, oh, wow. Uh, so I, I certainly think there's more work to be done. Um, uh, the I mean, for one thing, um, the the humility about expectations principle mm -hmm. is one that um it's related to a response to the problem of evil called skeptical theism yep. um i talk about that some in the book but that's that's a view that is um it still needs uh people are still objecting to it, it in interesting ways okay. in really challenging ways um uh in fact, some of the, you know, and some of the best objections that I know of are coming from, it's not even that they're coming from people who are fundamentally opposed to belief in God or anything like that, right? right. I mean, it's often Christian philosophers who think that solution just isn't working for me, mm -hmm. right? Um, so, uh, Michelle Ponchuk, again, who I mentioned a couple minutes ago, she she has a paper forthcoming in the journal of analytic theology that presses some i think really interesting objections um uh some i've had conversations with colleagues here but so there's a lot to be done on that um the story about religious experience that i told in the book mm -hmm. um i think i said explicitly that i was just sort of sketching a view at any rate even if i didn't say that 
<laughs> I think of it as more a sketch than as like, here's the last word on religious experience. Right. Um, there's a lot, I think, a lot more interesting stuff to explore there. Mm -hmm. um, there's, uh, I, I mean, I even though I have answers to it that I give, you know, and people say, um, you know, how how can you say with a completely straight face God loves us if you endorse this doctrine of transcendence and stuff? I, I think there's, um, I mean, again, I have. I have stories to tell there, but yeah. I think there's there's more work needs to be done on that. Okay. Um, so I don't know. I, I think there's still a lot of work left to do. Um, yeah, that's really helpful. Uh, so some of my classmates are going to be listening to this, and, and we all have to write you know research papers. So you just uh, helped a, a few of us think through our research paper for the, for the course. Yeah, that's really great. Well, Dr. Race, thanks so much for, for your time here with me. This has been really helpful. The, the book is fantastic. I've been kind of gushing about it, but... It's, it's rare that you cover so much in such a short uh, book. Um, but, but again, this is your, this is your Gifford lectures. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So it, it makes sense that, that it would be like, so such a good book. Um, but I, I think so much for, for the work that you've done in, in analytic theology, you've, you've made a way for a lot of us who like philosophy and theology to not have to choose one or the other. And that's been, that's been huge. You and, and Dr. Crisp. So thanks. Thanks for all the work that you've done. And, and uh, as always, like we're, many of us are looking forward to the next thing you're doing. So yeah. uh, really exciting and, and keeping an eye out for you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks for all the kind words and thanks for having me on your podcast. Yeah, it's been great. I'd, I'd love to have you on uh, open invitation. Maybe we can set this up uh, later uh, a couple months or something like that. We'll see, but I'd love to have you back on. So, so thanks again. It's been great. Cool. All right, so this has been Parker's Pensies, and as always, all glory 